If the only thing I knew about your religion was that its founder, its central text, its greatest scholars, and its most popular defenders all openly promoted pedophilia with one voice, like a giant chorus of Hollywood producers, that would be enough for me to conclude that your religion was sent straight from the pits of hell to degrade human beings by victimizing some of the most vulnerable among us. Now, we've all heard about Muhammad having sex with a prepubescent girl. We've read passages like Sahih al-Bukhari 5158. Narrated Urwa, the prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old and she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. We've seen our favorite Dawagandist, Ali Dawa, claiming that if his daughter got her first period at the age of nine, he would tell her that she's ready for marriage. If my daughter reached the age of menstruation at nine years old, I would say, you are ready, you are ready to get married. As revolting as it is to hear Ali Dawa say that he would tell a nine-year-old girl that she's ready for marriage, Keep in mind that Ali Dawa is a better man than his prophet, because his prophet didn't wait until Aisha had reached puberty. And we're proud of that. We've seen Sheikh Yasser Qadi tell Muslims to stop lying about Aisha by claiming that she was older than nine when her prophet penetrated her with his 54-year-old penis. And oh Muslims, don't apologize for the truth and don't distort the truth. There are, there are Muslims that try to deny this. Oh, he didn't marry Aisha as a young girl. Ya akhi, look, that's not the way forward. We don't lie for the sake of our religion. Astaghfirullah. We have the truth. We're not going to cover up the truth if people are, find it embarrassing. This is the reality. Deal with it. Our Prophet married a young girl and it was fine for the time. That's right. Don't be ashamed of your Prophet. Be proud of the fact that he spread the legs of a prepubescent little girl and forced his penis inside of her. And we're proud of that. During my last debate, we saw my opponent, a convert to Islam, try to convince me that marrying children is perfectly normal by giving me a book about child brides in America. Uh, before we get started, what I want to do, I would like to uh, gift David Wood with a copy of a book titled American Child Bride. A History of Minors and Marriage in the United States. Thanks, Kenny. But I already had a book on child brides. It's called the Quran. And we're proud of that. As if we didn't already have enough examples of Islam's perverted obsession with little girls, we're about to see Muhammad Hijab admit that the Quran promotes an extreme type of pedophilia. His words, not mine. Yes, I'm talking about the same Muhammad Hijab who sends us messages about golden showers and other disgusting fetishes that he can't stop thinking about. Yes, I'm talking about the same Muhammad Hijab who believes that deep down, non-Muslim women want to be raped by jihadis. This same Muhammad Hijab claims that if all we had to go on was the Quran, we would think that it's perfectly acceptable to have sex with five-year-old girls. According to Hijab, we only know that men should wait until girls are a bit older because of the hadith. But in the Quran, it's open season on five-year-olds. If you look just at the Quran, you will get the indication that you can have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. If you just read the Quran, it is halal, it would, just, it would be halal to have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. In Surah Al-Talaq, chapter 65, Verse 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who you can divorce and who you cannot divorce. And then he says, And the ones who had never been pubescent before. And by the way, this is very important, yeah? I want all Muslims to be aware of this. The reason why we don't have sexual intercourse with five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds or whatever is not because of puberty. Wait a minute, what did you say? It's not because of puberty, because that verse in the Quran actually says, Lam yahidn. They never had puberty before. You can't go around that. Now, we're about to hear more from Mr. Hijab, but I wanted to pause here to make sure that everyone understands his point about Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran. Let's read the verse 
which is a little confusing until you realize that it's talking about divorcing prepubescent girls after having sex with them. And those of your women, as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them the idda, prescribed period, if you have doubt about their periods, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their idda, prescribed period, is three months likewise, except in case of death. And for those who are pregnant, whether they are divorced or their husbands are dead, their idda, prescribed period, is until they lay down their burden. And whoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, he will make his matter easy for him. What is this mess? Really confusing and horribly written, right? Welcome to the Quran. In this verse, Allah is giving rules for divorcing women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle, which this translation calls monthly courses. Earlier in the Quran, Allah had declared that if a man divorces a woman, there's a waiting period before the woman can get married again. The waiting period, called the idda, was three monthly menstrual cycles. The idea was that there should be a waiting period in between husbands so that if the woman had a child, there wouldn't be any confusion about who the father was. But Muhammad's followers eventually asked him, what about women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle, either because they're too old or because they're too young or because they're pregnant? What do those women and girls do when we divorce them? So, Allah revealed Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, where he gives rules for divorcing women and girls who don't have a menstrual cycle because they're too old, too young, or pregnant. Allah says that if a man divorces a girl who's too young for a monthly menstrual cycle because she hasn't reached puberty, the girl has to wait three months before she marries another man. Not three menstrual cycles, the girl doesn't have a menstrual cycle yet. She waits three months instead. So that's what the verse means when it says, And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their idda, prescribed period, is three months likewise. In case you're wondering if this is what the passage actually means, let's look at three of the most respected Quran commentaries in history. According to Ibn Kathir, the words, And for those who have no courses, refer to the young who have not reached the years of menstruation, i.e. prepubescent girls. According to Tafsir Jalalain, this verse is referring to those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, i.e. prepubescent girls. Ibn Abbas gives the historical background, and for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if ye doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months, upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young, along with those who have it not because of young age, their waiting period is three months. So, the historical context of this verse is that a man specifically asked Muhammad about divorcing girls who were too young to menstruate, i.e. prepubescent girls, and Allah answered that the waiting period for a prepubescent girl to remarry after her husband divorces her is three months. What does this mean? It means that, according to the Quran, a man can marry a prepubescent girl, then have sex with her, then divorce her, then pass her on to the next man who can marry her, have sex with her, and divorce her, and so on, and so on, all before the girl has ever reached puberty. Since the Quran clearly allows grown men to marry prepubescent girls, there's nothing in the Quran that would prevent a grown man from marrying and having sex with a five-year-old girl. So, if you want to say that a man shouldn't have sex with a five-year-old girl, if you want to say that a man should wait until the girl is eight or nine, you have to go outside the Quran. This is the point Muhammad Hijab was making. Now, back to Hijab. The Quran doesn't say, doesn't say anywhere in the Quran that the woman has to be pubescent. I dare you to find one verse in the Quran 
where it says you're not allowed to marry someone based on harm, or you're not allowed to have sexual intercourse based on harm, or you're not allowed to marry someone based on puberty. So if you're a Quran alone, no, you're allowed to have no, sexual intercourse no, with five-year-olds. No, Get me one verse in the Quran which says the woman has to be pubescent. No. One verse. I want one verse in the Quran from the beginning of the book to the end of the book which says that she has to be perfect. So okay, so that makes it halal from your perspective. From your perspective it's halal. You know in the Quran it says It says you're not allowed to marry your mum. It says you're not allowed to marry your sister, your auntie. Where does it say you're not allowed to marry a person? I'm looking for one verse that you, you can say, you pinpoint it and say this is where it says prepubescent marriage or whatever is not allowed. So if you're Quran alone, you're still towards pedophilia and a severe type of pedophilia, a wife abuse, a severe type of wife abuse. Yes, Muhammad Hijab, one of the great dawagandists of our time, says that if you just go with the Quran, it will steer you towards a severe type of pedophilia. So if you're Quran alone, you're still towards pedophilia, a severe type of pedophilia. That's why we need the hadith to steer us towards a less severe, more moderate type of pedophilia. Think about this. There are perverts all over the place. We know about the Catholic priest scandals. There are atheist pedophiles. If you watch a few episodes of To Catch a Predator, you'll see sexual predators from all kinds of backgrounds. But here's the thing. People who think that sex with children is okay generally have to keep quiet about that. They don't get to go around running their mouths about the joys of pedophilia. If they were to openly promote pedophilia, they would run into some problems. Anyone who openly promotes pedophilia in the 21st century will be publicly exposed and condemned. There's only one exception. Where do you see grown men openly discussing sex with little girls and getting away with it? Where do you see grown men publicly trying to convince other grown men that there's nothing wrong with marrying little girls? Only in Islam, and it's just part of dawah. And the better you are at defending pedophilia, the more popular you'll become as a Muslim apologist. Only in Islam. If an atheist came out tomorrow and said, there's nothing wrong with a grown man having sex with a little girl, he would be shunned by the atheist community. If a Christian came out tomorrow and said, there's nothing wrong with a grown man having sex with a little girl, he would be shunned by the Christian community. But in Islam, not only is it perfectly acceptable to defend and promote sex with little girls, it's apparently one of the defining features of Islam's top scholars and most beloved apologists. Why are these grown men in Western nations in the 21st century openly defending and promoting pedophilia? Because their prophet was a pedophile. It is back finally. It is back finally. This is a power of religion. There's a reason to it. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah?